Ladies and gentlemen, Lee Johnston. Right, until someone gets me down. I do be mad. Good, thank you. I'm set this down here. Uh, evening, everyone. Jeez, it's not that bad. Look at the faces. <laughs> I don't wish you could read that with that. I'm sorry James is here, but he had to give me a lift, so uh, <laughs> I'll apologise for him now before he offends me. I need to get one in straight away because he's going to give me abuse at some no, point. No, no, no. Good job. Uh, good year for you. Good year. Yeah. Uh, Pete Rose. Yeah, I've good. I've been apart from the TT, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, but um, that was sort of on the list of excuses. Your eye is not working. Is on page fucking three hundred and twenty. I think it's not even. Well, a lot of people don't know. You've been here all year. I know you've been here because it just. I've seen quite a lot of it. At least two miles from my house, and because I've got a bit of room and some sheds, and he hasn't. He packs all. <laughs> but if, I feel like I've got to ask his permission if I want to leave some at the own place now. There's more of his stuff that I've, I've had people come up to me and ask me if there's room in James's shed to park something. <laughs> like an agent. Um, and you've been ill all year. Like, yeah, yeah. So. It's it's hard in our sport because the little time you do have on like TV or interviews or anything, if you go on straight away moaning, which, which is what actually is the case, but you just sound like a moaning. So my missus tells me anyway, but I uh, just sound like I'm moaning all the time. So you're just better off keeping quiet and trying to get on with it. But yeah, it's been it's been a tough year. It's been tough since I got diagnosed with the AS and everything. But even aside from that, I've been quite ill and stuff as well. So um, yeah, it's been hard trying to manage things, running the team and and. Obviously racing and everything as well, back on the full road camera and, and the BSB has been really busy. So I think I think from the second BSB I spent two months in the motorhome, I had me home with the back-to-back -back BSB, straight to Northwest, straight back to BSB, straight to the TT for three weeks. So it was, um, yeah, it was hectic. I know it's sound, like, it's sound like you're moaning now, people are going to work every week and I'm moaning about sitting in my motorhome and riding my motorbike and getting paid for it. But, it's it's a stressful environment, and if you're a little bit unwell going into that, by the time you come out of it, you're absolutely spent. So, yeah, we obviously missed the BSB then after the TT and tried to get myself um, somewhere near near going and just sort of managed to see the year out. I was at the pace, um, not so much a TT, but uh, on short circuits, you always at the pace, always on a quickest, sometimes quickest lap, I think two or three times, but suffered as you got further into the race, and I, I, I mean, quite a strong lad, normally quite a big lad, does a lot of training, never gets tired, I've never seen you getting up a bike tired, this year, he was getting off his bike, he just said, I'm not going to, I just yeah. couldn't even, I couldn't think. I think the hardest thing, because I've been, basically my, my theory, or what my dad always told me was that, I don't care if you get beat because someone's better than you, but if you ever get beat because you're not fit enough, well, it's not acceptable. If everybody's putting all the time, effort, money into you, um, and you get off and say, oh, well, I could have beaten, but I got a bit tired. Well, it's not really on. Is it? If, you, if someone beats you on the day of fair and square, that's it. And this is probably the first time in my life, especially now with BSB towards the end of the year, I've got off the bike absolutely fucked. Yeah, excuse my language, but... And, and two or three laps before the end, you automatically go into like autopilot as such. It's like, it's hard to explain. When you've done something for so long, your body, I can imagine it's like boxers, you see them getting near enough sparked out and they're still throwing a punch. That's a similar, a similar thing. So in the last two or three laps, I couldn't honestly tell you what really happened. I, I might have finished second or third and they go, well, why do you not win? And I go, I don't really know. And that's where I ended up. And, not in a danger sense, but just like I haven't got that sharpness to wanna to wanna take the take the win, or you're just clinging on for clinging on for it. So um, that that's frustrated me more than anything because, like, when I say I come into you and Park Fermi and you see you after, and I can say to you because we're we're really yeah, good friends, I'm like I'm spent, but I'm not going to start saying that on the TV. Oh, I'm, I'm not well, I'm not fit. You just sound like a, a moaner. So. Have you got your moment? On a more positive, I don't want to send him for the old Google Yeah, so yeah, we're getting there now. Because it's quite a rare blood disease that I have, it, there's an other side of it and stuff, so we've had to go private for a lot of it. And um, 
turns out the doctor I would see in his bugger off to, where did I say, Bermuda or somewhere? So, yeah, the phone calls are interesting, trying to get that sorted out in this country. But yeah, the biggest thing at the minute is trying to get that all sorted before Christmas, before we before we sign any contracts for next year, because I can't commit to things and, and say what I'm going to do without being fully fit and well. So that's just that. Uh, what is your plan for next year if you do you get? Ah, Short like, time road again. Yeah, Every like, year he says, I ain't going to win a British championship. <laughs> and then he goes. I'd like to win another TT, yeah. I, um, to win one is amazing, do you know what I mean? As a, a little boy, or especially coming from Northern Ireland, t- to be world champion is fine, but to win a TT, but, you know, that's what everybody wants to do for, for where we come from. And um, yeah, that's I need to do that again. And being in the window nearly there or not far off, and and not winning is, is frustrating. So yeah, that's the that's the aim for next year. As far as British Champions goes, I don't know why. I know you say to me all the time, other people go, oh, you're good enough to be there and be at the front, but I just, I want to try and get the balance right with being happy and committing to the races I commit to and trying to win them and not be worn out and just go for the sake of going at the end of the year. What happens when you're not racing? I know you're running a fairly successful team now, but it's successful because you're riding the bike. <laughs> can, you see a, can you see a time when you were in management and, and running a team and not riding? I don't know. I'd be hard on people, I think. I don't tolerate... Like, I've come from a normal working class background, you know what I mean? We come, it's not a council state, but we come from a three-bed semi. I've worked forever and a half. My parents do their money, and it sort of pisses me off. Even kids coming in now, and like I'd say this... this to give you some perspective, I don't know if people understand the cost of British Championship, but the average kid in British Championship World probably pays 60,000 quid a year for his ride. So he turns up, the bike's a play. That's not crash damage or anything. I'd say in the last month, I've had two or three kids walk up and go, Oh, if I give you 90 grand, would you run me next year? And they say it like, it's me buying you a car. And it almost pisses me off the fact that you go, You have never earned 90 grand, and you're, you're probably, I don't know, you're where you even think this money comes from if dad's paying for it and the spawn, whatever. And it's, it's almost frustrating to the fact that I would love to be in the position to have proper backers like it was in your day when you went to write for a team with the team team money, and then get a good kid that has nothing, do you know what I mean, and, and give them a chance. Because no teams do that nowadays, they all run them as a business. So, but just being in that position and, and the team actually working to get the money and to run someone else. So I think I, I would have more interest in doing that, but then that probably won't make me money, so it's it's going to be a trade-off. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. If, if I could do something like that, I would like to, but the fact that just going through the motions and running some kid that's probably not good enough, but his dad's got some money, it doesn't, doesn't interest me in the slightest, really. The TT thing, your dad didn't even want you to go to TT, did I mean... It's, it, it, the, the, the parents of the TT is quite a funny thing. I'm assuming most people in the room ride motorbikes, and even just riding a motorbike for some people to tell the parents that they, that they, they ride a bike is a bad thing. Telling your parents you're going racing for a lot of people would be, uh, again, something that, that kids don't want to do. But actually, to go and do the TT, that's a big step in that now. It just is. You, you know, it, it's. Well, it was natural to you, it was kind of natural for me, but how come you ended up going to teach you when you didn't want me to um, I think I, so it started by doing the North West. Um, I went just oh, because... Nice, nice Yeah, nice. but the team, the team I was riding for at the time of the British Championship were running Gary Johnson. Um, and they just said, oh, would you like to go? And I thought, oh, yeah. So I've been as a kid. There's a couple of universities there. There's a load of good nightclubs. So get to ride a motorbike. What could possibly be bad about that? So I thought, yeah, we're on. And my dad, bless me, he was like, oh, I'm not keen on this. Or that. I said, tell you what, if I go out, I might not like it. Do you know what I mean? And I wasn't really that excited about going. I just thought, I'll have a do, whatever. And I come what, in. What, what uh, R6, yeah. yeah. Um, and I come in and I was like, absolutely peaking. And I could see it in my dad's eyes. He was devastated. Do you know what I mean? I was buzzing and he was just sapping every bit of excitement out of me, just didn't want to do it. But I never said anything about the TT. I thought the best thing to do was not tell him. Then the newspaper dragged me up. They put it in the sun at home. My dad opened the newspaper and found out that way. 
What was the stage when you were racing short circuit then? Were you national champion? Yeah, I'd won, I'd won a British championship by then. And this would have been 2010, I think. So ah, yeah, I don't really want yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, he wasn't best pleased about that either when he found it in the newspaper. But I said to him that because it, I'd let it go that late, I said, well, the entry's in and the team's going. I said, we can't let people down. That was my theory of asking for forgiveness and not permission. So it worked out all right and we went. And I loved that as well. And I've loved it ever since. And it just frustrated me a little bit when, when I first went, I literally went to the Northwest the first year I was on the podium. And the first time I went to Ulster Grand Prix, I was on the podium. And it just took me, I was trying too hard at the TT or trying to make it fit. And it just didn't happen for various reasons. And, then I'd go to the classic TT and just ride around and win one and I was like, why, why is this happening or the attitude? And then in 19 I just thought, right, this is not happening, I'm going to go with the way I ride in Rich Championship and just relax and ride the bike and it started to come, do you know what I mean? So um, yeah, but it's, it's so easy when you want, so, or so hard when you want something that bad, telling your brain to go the other way is not... But I don't find that easy, so... You've always told me, last, last few years, you haven't even tried that hard at the TT. It's not... You've, you've really enjoyed it. You've said you're well within what you can do. You never, you never feel like you're, you're, you're checking... Yeah, you, you have to be careful saying that. Like, I know, Pete, yeah. Pete said stuff like that, and he's absolutely saying with the 190 mile hour with a yeah. wheel in the, the curb, and he's saying he's not trying. It's, it's just... You know what I mean? But, um, you are trying, but not like, to the extent of... Like, British Championship, do you know what I mean, into turn what brands hatching into the front tire, turned inside out with your knee on the ground, hoping it doesn't let go, do you know what I mean, that, it's just a completely different way of riding the motorbike and the feeling you get back from the motorbike and it's like, what's it, just figuring out that it's the momentum and the flowing through corners and this late break and being aggressive is just not the way you need to ride the motorbike and it just took me too long to figure that out and which it frustrates me a little bit the fact because I looked at whoever was beaten at the Northwest or the, the Ulster Grand Prix. Like I mean, they were the same people. There wasn't yeah. anybody new turning up. But yeah. It was the same people on the same bike. So different course, though. Yeah, but it was just the fact of the way I was doing it and going about my going about my work. Do you get nervous over there? Oh, do I? Um, yeah, it makes me laugh. I see kids in British Championship sitting on the grade and stuff, and they're like absolutely themselves, do you know what I mean? It's like the look rate. I'm like, how on earth? What? I would love to just plonk them at the TT and oh. that 30 minute buzzer goes off and goes, are you ready? And the feeling, it. but until until someone has that, or like you know you've been there, but until that's happened to you and the strip, the bit that gets me, right, you walk up to the start line and now it's got more, the boys, it's more and more busy, there's more and more VIPs and there's people they've got an understanding of what's happening, really they haven't really got a clue, but they're all looking like they're absolutely shitting themselves, I'm like, you're not even getting on a motorbike, you're stood here watching me, and then it makes you nervous, because you're looking at them, they're nervous, I'm like, why are they nervous, it's like, all right, I feel worse now, and it's not even a, so I reckon if you could, like your team, there's say six, seven guys in my team, and they, some of them won't even talk to me, they let me mooch about, some of them will have a crack, because they know what, that's what I want to do. And that environment's like perfect. So if, if we could remove everybody else and you had your own little comfort blanket with people around you up to the grid, it wouldn't be that bad. Well, that's what Fuchi does every time. He comes up last minute, he won't speak to anybody, advise it down, ready to go. You don't even go on, even when I was working over there and they wanted me to go up and get little, little words with people uh, waiting to go, queuing up. No, just coming in. And actually, there's, there's quite a few decent TT men and road men in, in the room here and you'll, you'll understand this I've sat on a lot of grids I've sat on 500 GP grids 125 GPs, British Championship, World Superbike, World Supersport and World Endurance and every single time I've been nervous but you, you, in, on short circuits you're nervous because you, you're scared of failing you're scared of not being as quick as what people think you should be that's the nerves. You, you've got to perform. And you get nervous. The other man, you've got all that, but you have actually got this, I always have this little thing, queuing up. And the only way they do it there, you're setting off two at a time or one at a time. Uh, it used to be two at a time in my day. And you can hear people in front going and then just revving and smoke. 
flowing around. It's, it, it's built by the time, you know, when you're setting up 12 or 15, you, you've got a few people going before you. And by the time you're getting that start box, you're on your own. Man, I've never, I've never been as nervous as what I was on the road I've ever. Yeah, but you enjoyed a good crash on short throw, didn't you? So that didn't happen. <laughs> well, that's, the whole point is, I used to think, do you know what? If you get it wrong once in the next couple of hours here, it's going to be a big flipping, it's going to, you're going to make a mess yourself. And that's the, that's just adds to, that's the last bit of the nerves, isn't it? Yeah, that, and that's what people say. Oh, if you get nervous when you're riding round, you're like, no, that's the, the whole enjoy. Literally, as he taps you on the back, then it's like you've just been set free or whatever. That's fine, that bit, until you get back and well, whatever, even after you're not nervous. But literally, if I could. If someone could go to you, like make a wish, I could go, if I could take the last 45 minutes before a race, if someone could put me on a little time machine and literally have that boy tap me from there yeah. to there, that would be the best invention ever, because that would just take away all of it. Because the, that is the worst feeling, you know what I mean, of nerves and you're pacing around. And it's just, yeah. You actually go when you get going. Oh, even, yeah. though you, even though yeah. you're riding Anderson in and you've got pressure on you to win, and if you're not doing as well as you think or your team think you should do, that's going to take a bit of Do you actually enjoy riding? Yeah, you're obviously the, the, you, you race to win, do you know what I mean? That's the thing in the short circuit or whatever. And if you don't win, we all stomp around like spoiled kids, do you know what I mean? But I think you do, uh, at the TT, there is the, the, the most enjoyable night for me is the first night of practice because there's absolutely no... You just blowing that up, I think. No, no. Um, <laughs> it's the first night of practice because there's absolutely no shit. If everybody's going, oh, just build yourself in there, and you literally just go out and ride your bike to do three, four, five laps. That is the best feeling. And, and honestly, the classic PT is a little bit the same. Do you know what I mean? Because there's obviously no pride. And, there's no, and you're obviously, it's funny, they all, they all go, oh, yeah, we're just going for a ride around. Everybody is trying, like, up on these bikes that really shouldn't, you shouldn't be riding that hard. But at the end of the day, if you do break down, you have a watch of your mates going past, have a wave, and it doesn't really matter. But when you do do well, it's an amazing feeling, you know what I mean, as well. But you just, it's a lot more relaxed, there's no pressure on, there's not a lot of media stuff to do or stuff for sponsors, and it's just not like everybody's cramming a microphone in your camera or something like that. You can go out during the day, enjoy the island, the weather's maybe decent, and it's just a, a real fun environment. And, and I think that's maybe what it would have been like for TT riders years ago that weren't maybe fully in factory. Well, I suppose they were that busy looking after the bike, probably not, but just that, I think that would be the enjoyment side of it. And, and now, obviously, the bigger it gets, the more money there is involved, there is pressure. But if you still can't have that little bit of enjoyment, then why are you, why are you doing it? Yeah, I think with the other man especially though, with racing in general, there's a, a challenge uh, aspect to it. Because I know a lot of people who want to be racing back, but never really got to the arse and made it happen, and then complained that it would have been quicker than you if they had done it. It's a, a strange thing. So if you get up and ask them to race in a motorbike in Cadwell or trucks and wherever, I've taken that out to you. But actually, Get put yourself on that road at the Isle of Man, whether you, you, you're on your own team or... That's a, look yeah, the, the, the biggest thing in respect on the roads is that, like, if I'm sitting in Port Fermi after the race and we're in the podium bit or whatever, and some bloke that comes past that I maybe don't need, it could be 40th or 50th or whatever, I will look at him in the visor a wee and go, Fair play, do you know what I mean? I've got genuine respect for that man. Yeah. Whatever, speed, whatever speed he's doing, he's going as fast as he can. Yeah. A British championship, if, if someone's not in the top three or four or if races with me or whatever, I wouldn't, I've got, you know what I mean? Unless they're in my vicinity of I need to know what their plan is or what, how it's going to yeah, benefit no me, I've no interest, yeah. do you know what I mean? I've no don't care what they're doing or whatever, I've no respect. Not that I'm, not in an arrogant way, I've no respect, but it just doesn't yeah, enter in my head, yeah, it doesn't enter in my head. But, I, at the TT, I would consciously think fair play to that man for, for what he's doing. The last six you had a British Championship, you're as quick as anybody on it, um, like I said, fastest lap of some of the races even this year. How different is it when you set up at the Isle of Man? What, what, is it exactly the same bike, same suspension, same everything? Yeah, pretty much. The only thing, there's two things that are different on it, so the radiator's different, because on the British Championship it's got a big bore rod on it, because it needs to, oh, fire me again. Um, needs the temperature, oh, <laughs> um, needs the temperature uh, keeping down, 
but uh, and then obviously the bigger tank. That is the only two things. The suspension is completely the same. Well, we run Dunlop tyre, and years ago the size of the tyre used to be massively different, but it's not so much now. So um, yeah, it's pretty much the same. People think, oh, you soften them all off and whatever you don't. But when you're doing 128 mile an hour or 600, it's under the same forces as what it is a British Championship. So it needs to be within the same same window. If you had been a bad so what would you have been? I heard you were the hairdresser one. Toby, you're a load shorter than me. Um, well, he's a midget, no matter what. I don't know. know. To be honest, like, actually, I did do, uh, he's not taking the piss, I did do hairdressing when I left school because I went to. I knew I wasn't going to stay, but I went to. What's it called when you're. It's not college, yeah, tech. I went there. And all my mates were doing welding or something or whatever, and I thought, that's not getting dirty all day. So um, <laughs> I went, I went there was this just two, and honestly, there was 25 lasses in this queue. I thought, I'll queue up there and see what, see what that's all, see what that's all about. And I was there for six months, probably the best six months of my life. And then, um, then I left and moved to England. I signed for raceways and stuff when I was maybe 17, would have been 17 and a half, and moved to Bolton. I don't know. Uh, Oh, oh. the fly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, um, but yeah, I did that, but I don't know, to be honest, I don't, I, I'm trying to think now what I might do when I finish racing, so I might have to, to answer that, but yeah, I don't know, I'm, in, I'm into quite a lot of different things, and I'm obviously not really intelligent, or I wouldn't be riding more about, but, um, yeah, I, I honestly don't know, maybe your job. That's coming. Yeah, I don't know. It could be a what? It could be a poet. Poet? Yeah, well, yeah, it's been said before. Influence. <laughs> Definitely. The influence I have, people do not need that in their life. Yeah. Anybody got a question for Lee? Yeah. Not a shark? What? Ireland. Northern Ireland. There's two different countries. Northern Ireland, which is a massive motorcycle mecca, really. Have you done like lots of scaries and uh, kells and all them sort of things? No, I've never, never done any. So I literally, how I started racing, I played football till I was about 15, 14, 15. And um, I literally got fed up. I played for my county, for Northern Ireland and everything. I come home one day and my dad just said, oh, bear in mind he drove me around the country for about three years or less. So I swear, not for me, this football dad, I can't be bothered anymore. And he went, he meant it. Yeah, and uh, my mate at the time, one of my friends, who uh, turned out to be Josh Elliott, that's a yeah, yeah. champion rider, he was racing mini motors. And uh, that was like, I always had bikes as a kid and stuff, but just like annoyed the police and ripped road around fields and stuff, nothing that you should be actually doing. And um, he went to this mini motor day, and there was like, a thing where you could like hire a bike and go into the race. and. Turned out I was accidentally quite good at it, and we bought a bike. And Plus, I did it. Oh, yeah, it's like a super bike to me, that kind of um, Yeah, won, won some races on that. And my dad um, had been in the bikes his whole life, but he knew nothing about a two stroke. And obviously, one, two, fives then were two strokes. So he said, We're not doing that. So he just put me straight on to a 600. And um, we did a year did a year in Ireland uh, riding 600. I did a couple of rounds in British Championship, like just to try and learn some tracks and stuff, and then come over the, the next year and won the stock, Junior Stock Championship, and then that sort of got me my ride. So I was too young then to go road racing as such at the time, and then I kind of did, did British Championship. And then when I did eventually go road racing, that was the, the only deal we had. I wasn't allowed to do any, any little ones, and the, the ones that I do do now are the only ones I'm allowed to do. Before he passed away, he made me promise that I wouldn't just go and do the Southern or something because you get used to riding with certain riders. You know, like the top six or eight lads on the road, the top six, you ride with the same people nearly all the time, so you know exactly what they're doing. And I could go to someone, somewhere like the Southern and not know the track and qualify 10 to 15 and be in with a lot of people I don't know or something, maybe not even my own fault, and just write yourself off or something that's not really going to benefit your, your career as such. So. Have you been around the uh, scale? Yeah, Dean took me around the Southern one day in the car. Oh my God. It was like, when <laughs> when you do a track, you sort of have the idea of speed, but it was like, I don't know the names of anywhere. I've been, I've been to Watts this year. It's amazing. 
amazingly late race to go and watch it. But he took me out of the back and it was just warm as ever. It was like being on the car and he was just like, oh yeah, this bit's flat out and this bit's flat out. I'm like, fuck, I didn't, you can't even see through the corner, do you know what I mean? It's like, so you'd lose two or three seconds there by not, you know what I mean? It's not, not for me this. So um, yeah, I probably wasn't the best person to go and get an idea of what the track was like. But um, yeah, as I say, I enjoy going watching and it was funny this year when we did go and watch it was like some old boy stood beside me and I was like proper excited <laughs> when you all come past and then it just made the flat out and smell a few of them and they were looking at me like why are you getting so excited or what you know what I mean because you race I was like just because you, you're fit to ride and like, it doesn't mean you don't can get excited when somebody comes past at 200 miles an hour like you know what I mean there's still that little boy in there that went to watch and... I think he's made them up for you because you actually know what's going on. You yeah, know, yeah. You know what they're doing. Oh, man, like the amount of things I seen go wrong or saying, oh, well, that's run off there, it's Mr. Gear there or whatever. And they're all going, oh, it's, they had no idea, do you know what I mean? So, um, but yeah, it was, I really, really enjoyed it. The weather was mega and we just, we just went over for the day, so... We chatted about, just uh, earlier, we chatted about uh, people were born with a lot of talent. Who's the most talented guy you've ever written again? What, that hasn't achieved their talent? Yeah, some haven't. I mean, I've written with a lot of people. And the two that I thought were most naturally talented, one won a couple of world championships, but one never won anything. But yet, I know we said. So, have you seen anything in... I think I think people like that that having so people like Glenn Richards, I don't know if anybody knows him, but when Bayless and then come over, he was smoking all them in Australia, come to England, got a little bit comfortable, just stayed and never went on. So it's like and it's not like their level because he was already at a really good level. But I think um like people my age, uh that spring to my people like Dan Linford is an unbelievable motor bike racer. When and realistically if he if he come good now he would be in Grand Prix because he got a shot on shit 250 and yeah. you know what I mean it wasn't right at the time that Dorna wasn't putting the money in and stuff but um, I don't know my age actually to be honest um, yeah yeah I think yes young young lads like that it's hard it's hard you always you always want to say yes but you don't know at what point they would have stopped because some people take things up really he was obviously an amazing natural talent he's a lot like dv i suppose he come did it all he come from supermoto and, and stuff like that there and he, you could tell on the bike he looked free on the bike or loose on the bike um but yeah it's, and it, yeah you think that was a good that is actually a good one but at what point they stop getting better or because your talent takes you so far and then you have to work really hard to to get the last little bit, um, but I don't know you. Uh, definitely, course the truck course was never did a stick of work, never trained, just got on his motorbike and could ride it really well. And he won a couple of world championships, and I think he probably had four or five in him if it had been if he'd put the effort into something like Vegas. Yeah, it was a drinking world championship. He'd win that, though, wouldn't he? He's still on with that. Yeah, he's dedicated. Um, dedicated. Probably the most talented guy I've ever seen on a bike was Anthony Gold. Oh, yeah. Unreal. Just unreal. Someone's, someone's trying to find him at the minute to do a... We found some pictures of him, yeah. They, they, they've actually lost him, like nobody knows. I, he, he got in, he's he's nobody in, uh, I don't know, in this day and age, with all the social yeah. media and cameras, he has been lost for like I don't know how many months and nobody knows where he is. <laughs> how is that possible? No, it's because you're dead. <laughs> but actually, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's about, I found some pictures of him, he's, he's still about, he's been through hard times, but his problem was, he was that good, he didn't, he didn't know how he was doing what he was doing, and so when it went wrong, he couldn't fix it, because he didn't know what had gone wrong, he just, he was so talented, he came through, uh, won some super bike rounds, got really quickly into the Grand Prix, and in 1997, I was riding, I was set to ride um, factory Suzuki superbike with a guy called Mike Hale, an, um, an American. And we did a lot of private testing, just Suzuki. But it always ended up, uh, me and Mike Hale with the superbike, run by Alice, English team, but a lot of Japanese mechanics. And we 
test with the 500 team that, that year was Dan Beatty on his second year and Anthony Gover who was just their fresh signing. And he turned up at his first test and imagine you've signed, you've only done, you've only done three seasons racing, you signed for one of the biggest GP 500 teams. This is a once in a lifetime, this is his opportunity, right? Or I would see it that way. So he's had his first day's testing at a place called Charalan in Malaysia. And we'd all finished and it's really quite warm and humid and we're all sat debriefing and we're in one garage and, and the 500 teams in the next garage. And there's probably six or eight Japanese and a lot of English crew waiting for Anthony to go and Dalabriti to get off the bike and then give them their feedback and it's just a big debrief situation. They're all sat there with notepads and, and pens and he came in the garage, this is the first time for a new team, you want to do a good job and look like you're serious. I know. Not go, but bear in mind he'd be quickest out of anybody on track just 10 minutes earlier. And he comes in the garage and he says, Right, we need two things. So they're all there with the pens, ready to go. And he said, We need a cage in the back of the garage with a dancing lady in it, <laughs> and we need some beers for the fridge. Go, what down? That was it. Didn't want to know about suspension, didn't tell them about tires, didn't tell them about geometry. No, didn't but some, sometimes the most direct approach is the best, so he knew exactly what he did. <laughs> but I knew two things, right? But by the end of that test, I knew that he had probably seen one of the most talented blokes naturally on a motorbike. Second thing I knew, they were going to fail. Because you got to work. you got to work at that. It was, it was funny like big care. Yeah. Which is why he's disappeared and nobody knows where he is now. Yeah, it's, it's cra it is crazy, isn't it? There, there's actually a test now that um, Red Bull do to, to tell if you've got, I don't know how, well, we were talking about it at the TT, but some seemingly the Onchu uh, twins, is that the right way to say it? But yeah, they they tested them and stuff and said, yeah, you will be really, really good, but they haven't got, so say if you need six things to be, they fit to ride the bike, they fit to think about the race, they fit to think about the tyres, overtaking, whatever other brilliant capacity that needs. Uh, they say if you had five out of six, you're going to be at a top level, but you haven't got everything and stuff. And I, I'd love to know what the test is and see if I could even scrape <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't know how. Like, well, you were simple, right? You just have one of them little a drawing of a of a. Of a why why did that be right? little? And could be a big thing. <laughs> well, you wouldn't go up to the fucking <laughs> required hour. Uh, uh, you're not getting on this ride, son. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I would like to know, though they obviously they're never, they'll put massive research in to figure that out or whatever they've done on the Formula 1 team, so they're never going to release it, but it'd be really interesting to see um, what it does or what, what you have to do. You know, sometimes you get a lot of people putting a lot of research in, they come out at the end of it after six months of research with the most simple answer in the world that everybody knew anyway. Well, right, Guy Martin, right, one of the weirdest blokes I've ever met, privileged to meet him, you know him, I know him, a lot was annoying. And he's a, he's a good bloke, he's a funny bloke, and good luck to him, and he's made a career for himself because people like him because he's quirky, right? But, strange man there. I had to go and do, I didn't have to go, I got asked at last minute, a bloke called Barry Nutley was another commentator, we're going to go and do a, a charity night with him. And Barry got ill, he got a call, so I got asked the day before, will you come and interview? Uh, guy Martin from the 450, mostly non motorcyclists. These guys know him because he's a TV personality, they've been watching his building of a boat and the, all the other stuff. Some motorcyclists, but he was mainly non motorcyclists, right? There's 450 of them all paid big money for a, a table and a meal and everything, and I've got guys like, just like this. And I've done a little bit of research and I knew that he was going to go and do some kind of epic. 1800 mile bicycle ride down the spine of America, you know, we were going from Alaska to Mexico, whatever, big, big, hell of a thing, big talk of a thing. Yeah, well, he's, he's, he's teeing up for this thing, right, he's training, and he's super strong, lad, he. So I asked him about that, and he said, oh, well, the big thing, and he got right into it, he's just, he's on a, he's on a roll, and, and you were losing a few people straight away, and he's <laughs> and he said, yeah, because it's, it, 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 you've got to support yourself. You can't have a battle. There's no van. There's, you can't, you can't, 
have anybody bringing you stuff, you've got to carry everything you need, so you've got to carry all your equipment you need for your bike, you've got to carry everything, you've got main thing you've got to carry, there's food, but you can't have any, just any food. He says you, you've got to have high calorific value, because that's what you need, because you're cycling, you know, 200 miles a day, so you need high calorie, but low weight, because you don't want to carry a ton of weight. Alright, so he says, yeah, and we've had some scientists on it, right, they've been on with it for two months now, and they, they know what the biggest bang for the weight kind of food is. And I says, what is it? And everybody's looking like, what is it? Some gel or some sugary, he goes, pork scratchings. <laughs> All right? Pork scratchings guy, he says, yeah, pork scratchings. It just yeah. happened to be that he was and sponsored by Mr. Whatever at that time. <laughs> and it, I, I didn't know what to say, I just, pork scratchings, yeah, pork scratchings. And everybody else is listening thinking, Right. And then he said, and something really good's happened. I've rung him, and I, I am now an ambassador for Mr. Porky's. <laughs> so basically, he sent him a, a truckload of pork scratches, and off he went. And did 1800 miles. Yeah. It worked. Yes. Get the scratches out. <laughs> Bottle water. No, Mr. Porkies, please. <laughs> if that's the case, McGuinness, if you fit the right American over hey, he he loves to scratch. He's lost five kilos. Yeah, John McGuinness is as, as svelte as I've ever seen him. He's down to, he's, he's peaking because he said for the first time in like 25 years, he got on the scales and his weight begins with an eight, eight kilos, begins with an eight, not a nine. He's normally about 98 of 99 kilos. And now he's uh, 89.9. 89.9. <laughs> <laughs> That's good for him though, I think it's 5 kilos. And hey, we've got a question for Lee before we wrap it up. Yes, was that, well, I was just going to say, was that the hardest you've ever ridden at Donington? That second race? Um, PS3 Supersport. Did yeah. you imagine the wheels off that? Uh, is, is that a good race this last couple of years? I don't know because I can't remember the last three or four laps, but um, <laughs> up until that point, yeah, I I wouldn't say it's not hard. It frustrates me. Well, I'm just getting old, but like uh, it's super sport race now, be like 17 laps or something, and these kids will be tearing the lumps out of each other. But well, that's what it makes great television. I'm like, we've got another 14 laps. Okay, we don't need to. You don't need to be leading now. None of us had the pace to get away. Somebody pass and cost you half a second, then you have to put the work back in. And when I, it's probably the only race I watch back all year, but I watch it back and I thought, yeah, it made for great television. You were doing the moves. So. Yeah, but I, it, it's a case of like you hear the commentators in Moto Three. If you either pass or you be passed, that's that's it. What ends up happening? So about twelve laps in, I'm thinking I turned into these fucking lunatics. I mean, I'm doing, you know, but it's just the way that you have to ride. Tether. If you're not in the two, something worse happens. It's, it's not too bad when the group of four goes away, because then you know. But um, yeah, I was I was riding hard, and I I made a mistake. I knew that I uh, my gearing pattern was different, and into the last chicane, I was going through a third. But I could only do that if I was in front and could carry the momentum, and I was in second. So I went back to second, and the engine brake strategy wasn't fit for it, and the bike was backed in. So it was my human error that caused the caused the mistake and we ended up, uh, we ended up, uh, yeah, yeah, we had a do or die move, but um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it, yeah, I say, I say I felt, felt good on the bike, and, but yeah, I wasn't good enough on the day, so we didn't win. Yeah, oh, we were. Obviously, if I had a criticism, generally of short circuits, it is that you've got the pace, but you kind of, you haven't got stuck in sometimes, but I thought yeah. you sh should do. Just scared up, man. <laughs> yeah, it's like a different. Yeah, it is. It's like it's it's hard. So if if someone said to you that you were going to go on the best holiday of your life in three weeks' time, and you a little bit of a dangerous job to do before that three week holiday, you'd be sort of wrapping yourself up a little bit, wouldn't you, before you went? And that's sort of the theory. And then after the the TT, you normally come back and go, right, they're having it now, but because I was sort of burned out at the time, it took me then two or three meetings to literally have interest again in, in getting going, because I knew I wasn't, if you know yourself, you're not physically fit enough 
to be there at the end of the race, but what really is the point? Because you're not going to win, do you know what I mean? So that was sort of the thing. But yeah, once we got going, then it was then at that point sort of gone into and around the four that I started to feel a little bit better, or started to figure out what what was what was going on. What was? Yeah. So my question is, you both kind of a bit knowledge of the old man. Um, is there a particular bit at the start where you're thinking that's the one that I'm scared of? That's the bit of this race I'm scared of. Most of it for me, really. Uh, <laughs> I knew. I knew I could probably make a mistake at most places because I knew I tried and what my ability stroke experience allowed and um, it wouldn't have surprised me if I'd have hurt myself around there. I did have a good crash there which is the last year then in 89 I had a huge crash off a 1100 Suzuki production bike that were not the best things to ride down there in terms of accuracy and, and you know the way they worked then, they were big heavy things. And, um, Lucky to get away with it and took it as a bit of a warning, which is why I didn't go back. But so it all fried me pretty much. You know, you know what I was doing in 1989? Hey, hey, this is good. Being born. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Made my night that ass. <laughs> you were launching yourself, but I was just being born. I launched myself into a field, freeze at 20 men, yeah. Um, my, uh, I, I want to say, I don't, it doesn't scare me in the sense, but it frustrates me. So like Ginger Hall to Ramsey, or like the guys were saying about, uh, Rob was saying about um, being bigger or being physical. And like I weigh 64, 65 kilos, and all them places where another 10 or 12 kilos actually keeps the bike down, you know what I mean? So there's times when I'm in midair and I'm like, oh, just be on the ground, or just, you know, so I can actually get going. So. And anywhere, anywhere like before going on the Sulby Strait or whatever, where it's like big, fast corners where you have to change direction, it's like you struggle with that. I, I struggle physically um, making the bike, making the bike move. So, um, but you can have good looks on half height and everything. Can you? So you have to, have to get on. <laughs> yeah. one, of, one of the things you do know is the old man more than anywhere else is. There's so many really fast changes in direction, so it depends what bike you're on, but all bikes going at high speed have uh, inertia, they don't want to turn. If you're going, it's like you get people coming on track days and they're more nervous at airpins, and the reason they're more nervous going slow is because at 20 mile an hour, that bike, the only thing keeping it on its wheels is you with your input. There's, there's no gyroscopic stability going at 20 mile an hour, so the bike just wants to fall over, and it will fall over. But when the bike's going really fast, it's got a load of stability because the wheels are going around. It's, it's a lot of gyroscopics going on. But the other man, you're changing direction, going so quick, 180, 109 miles an hour at times, just don't want to turn. So you've got to make that bike turn. And there's not many race circuits, certainly not a short, not a lot of short circuits, you know, circuit type uh, tracks that, that you ever get that. So it's, that's the physical part about the other man. Not, not being over so far that you're on the limits of grip and like Lee said, you're not you're not feeling for the front going or balancing how much weight you've got on each end to make it grip where you need it to grip. There's none of that. It's just about making the bike be in exactly the right place, pointing the right way. That makes sense. Never really did to me when I went, but I get it now. <laughs> Anybody else? No question. What's your favourite uh, modern classic superbike? I'll see you quite a bad music, or like arsehole, everybody's got one on it. But um, no, I, I honestly, the I, I, I can't, so Rob, the, the Zenixar is massive, isn't it? Like the, the length of the tank on it, we had one. I did three laps of Scarborough on it, and we put it up for sale. It's fine, I can't physically ride this, it's just too big. And when you sit on something, like, my uh, super bike tank sometimes made smaller and everything and the bit that, this is not trying to be weird, but the bit that's actually between your legs is what gives you the feeling of the size of the bike, do you know what I mean? The bike could be quite high off the ground or whatever and when you're going that doesn't matter. But they've physically got a really big wide tank and the bars are quite far away so you never feel like you're fully in control of it. So I hated it and the 45 is the opposite, it's really small, probably not as fast or whatever as the ZXR, but it looks a lot nicer, doesn't it? And it sounds a lot nicer. So well, we've all read it. Yeah, looks over winning. I think is the the rare occasion that 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 falls off. But 
yeah, I, I do enjoy riding that. I, I really wanted to bring our 250 this year, but we brought the 45 instead. So hopefully next year we're going to bring we're going to bring both and have a have a proper joy. Uh, Honda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Not my old. No, not my old. Yeah, that's one. Yeah, team. yeah, yeah. We bought one from America about two years ago with quite a lot. Of have you ever ridden that? No, I've ridden it at Scarborough. Yeah, but not um, not on a proper job. Yeah, yeah. It should fit me. Um, Fit me good. The only time I've ever rode a two-stroke was Clive's at the, at the TT when the year we won the Classic. So I did maybe three laps, I think, and then just set off into the race. But yes, yeah, the first time that I even could put both feet down and actually felt fully in control of what I was sitting on. So yeah, it was a nice feeling. Another <laughs> question for me, Bob Rafael. Anybody? Just one last one. Yeah, I've got that. What transition is it from going from a hobby where it's like I'm the last? I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it becomes Yeah, um Is this getting recorded now? <laughs> can you worse can you cut this bit out? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, at that at that point is the only time in my life for having big crashes and you think a big crash on Paget's bike at the T T in seventeen and I was in a bad way then sort of and I thought, Oh, this might be this might be it sort of thing but, but outside of that, yeah, I'm, I've enjoyed riding my bike every day and I still do now, I don't. It's a it's a really funny thing. There is there is a time when because people are paying you to do it and because there's pressure, and if if you go and you perform and you win races, mate, everybody's happy. But actually, it's when you're not doing what you think you've been paid to do, or what you expect to do, or what your team expects you to do, for whatever reason, might be that you've changed. I mean, it's all it, uh, now it's all come to all tires. But I remember being on mixed tires, and I just didn't like them on year in World Super Sport, and didn't have a good time with it. But for whatever the reason, if you're not performing, then you're not really enjoying it. But then, when you stop doing it, you realise what a good thing it was. So what I, what I would say to people is, think about it before you... Do you miss that? Yeah, I miss it a lot. Yeah. And I think I, I think I retired at the right time. And I, and I don't miss, I don't actually miss riding bikes, because I can ride bikes every day of my life. I've got a lot of motorbikes, I do a lot of track day, I do a lot of road riding, trail riding. What? You miss being good at it. I was, it's my, I, I was only ever good at one thing, and that was racing motorbikes, and now I don't do it anymore, so I'm just. That's like a test of your ability. That's like a Yeah, you've got to get used to the fact that you're normal again. And I don't think oh, that sounds big at that, but you're back to being just normal, average person. Who, and I have done really well, I mean, I accept, I, I get that. It took me quite a while to think. You know, just to, to not watch a race on telly. And I, I, I thought for two years of watching her go, yeah, I could go better than that. I, I would have won 36 around there two years ago. Still does that now. I fucking don't. <laughs> I don't. You've got to move on and you've got to pass the baton on and you've got to understand that there's people who, you know, that you couldn't do what you used to do. Because life runs on it. Some sports are even worse if you're a football, you're not going to have as long as it, at it as what we probably would in race, You've got your track there, don't you? You can put back into other people that you can see them. Yeah, but it's not. It's not that like we're all proper selfish people. Do you know what I mean? To be, to, and you have to be to do because you sacrifice everything for. You know what I mean? You, everybody around us has to give up everything. You miss when birthdays, everything. And I, I think more for me. It's, I love riding my bike and everything, but I love like the pressure of putting yourself in this. Sticky situation, like a stressful environment. I'm going, yeah, I need, you know, if I've got anything about me, I should be fit to do this. Do you know what I mean? And I do the same if I'm not, I haven't been well for a while and I can't ride my bicycle. I go out on my bicycle and I absolutely torture the life out of myself. And I, be, I get, I get home, I don't even know why I've done that, but there's just something in me that makes me want to. Normally, that I'm on my electric bike, so <laughs> I've got me terrible and he's going to keep up. But you're talking like a typical athlete, that's what you are. Every sport in life, for instance, whether you're Crown Green Bowls champion or a World Superbike champion. I don't think Bowls really falls into that. Like, that's what you see it stretching the bar there. <laughs> 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 you're a sportsman, 
and yeah. you're tucking in there, you'll sacrifice everything. And you'll be the biggest self drink that it's empty of yourself and anyone else. You yeah, know, not, not you know, you. No. No, but that falls in. No, if you do the ball, you're not, yeah. you're not determined of it. But that falls into, like you saying about. <laughs> Like my, I'm lucky. I've got a really good boss now. Do you know what I mean? And he will, he'll go. He'll be, like we talk straight to each other, and like same as James will say to me or whatever. But if you've got anything about you, you know that. I don't need. Like I'm harder on myself than anyone would ever be on me. Do you know what I mean? So if he said it was shit, I'd have already thought that, figured it out, and think of what I'm going to do. I'd be going, oh yeah, cheers, James, and that it wouldn't even enter my head. Do you know what I mean? Yep. You may as well tell you that though. Your mates are the most likely, or the people nearest you, your missus or whoever, the most likely go, nah, that looks good. And, and it's, it's everybody else who you don't have to worry about. It's, but you, the people who know you, the closest will tell you. And you should be able to take it off. I've only hit her back a few times, but she's got over it now, actually. You won't be in Phil, would you? <laughs> My boss is a big lad, so I just stand there and go, yes, yes. But. Last question for Lee, come and wrap it up. Everybody wants to go home, look. You got it. <laughs> uh, right, um, put your hands together for Lee, um, for Robert, for Chris, for the game.